The principle of specificity refers to the widely accepted notion that the most useful exercises are those that closely match the activities they seek to train. This refers not only to biomechanics, but also energy systems and all other aspects. In other words, the best way to get better at chopping wood is to practice chopping wood. The next best way is to use the cable wood chop. Bicep curls? Not so useful. A good sports coach must therefore select their exercises through the lens of specificity. Alternatively, a movement may be chosen that develops the underlying physical attributes that contribute to that movement, such as isolation work for a crucial muscle group. Finally, general physical preparedness may be used insofar as it helps to balance out the physique, prevent injury and contribute to an overall more healthy individual. Conditioning time is limited, so every exercise needs a good reason to exist in the programme. Coaches will likewise typically increase the specificity as they get closer to the competition date. Thus, functional coaches like JC Santana of the Institute of Human Performance advocate for the use of exercises like the truck push in favour of squats for improving running speeds and jumping heights. This is predicated on his observation that the truck push involves more similar joint angles and trains such attributes as ankle stiffness at approximately 90 degrees. In short, this provides what we refer to as superior transference. The skill trained more closely matches the intended outcome. Squats aren't bad, they are just suboptimal by comparison when the goal is specifically to improve running speed. But not everyone agrees that this is the best strategy. There is an alternative viewpoint, that training with exercises too similar to the skills targeted could actually be detrimental to an athlete's performance. The reason for this being that they may lead to interference. Interference means that a new skill or movement pattern can actually complicate an existing one. Two similar movement patterns could conceivably confuse the athlete, causing them to harm their own performance. Critics of functional training such as Mark Ripto thus argue that the better strategy is to train an athlete's general strength and then to pile skills training on top of that. Ripto and his followers believe that the compound barbell lifts are all you need alongside skills training. Ripto believes that strength is a universal property, that you're either strong or you're not, and that thus being strong in the squat means you're strong full stop. He also believes that traits like higher fast twitch fibres are so largely genetic that all we can do is to train for strength and hope that that helps our skill. This, I believe, is misguided. Neural maps aside, the truth is that the traditional barbell lifts alone fail to train the different planes of motion and myriad muscles involved in useful movements. Generally, it is agreed, for example, that twitch fibre density is roughly 50% genetically predetermined. That leaves 50% wiggle room. Fascinatingly, our level of plasticity itself also actually seems to be genetic to an extent. And other things like blood supply, tendon hysteresis, all of these can be trained to an extent. And many of these aspects also contribute to explosiveness. More to the point, if strength gains really were global, bodybuilders wouldn't need to train with isolation. In fact, you would only need one exercise. You could just perform the squat. The simple fact is that you can't get stronger obliques without some form of twisting, or at least anti-lateral flexion. Without using the muscle group in question, you can't expect to cause metabolic stress, muscle damage, etc. And the notion that squats and other compound moves trigger such a huge release of testosterone that it results in more muscle building throughout the body is actually also mistaken. The surge in testosterone we see during training is temporary, like the surge experienced when watching an action movie, and there are studies showing that this does not contribute to hypertrophy. If you want to see these studies for any of this, then click on the link in the description down below where you'll find the full article on my website, and that includes links to all of the relevant studies. Even the bioenergetic properties of heavy lifting are ineffective for most sports and exercises. Training endurance and work capacity would undoubtedly be more useful for the vast majority of competitive sports, if you had to choose. This is not to say squatting is useless, far from it. Squats improve mobility, they build core strength, they develop amazing strength in the posterior chain, and they increase bone density but they alone are not sufficient to provide the necessary one-legged strength, the stability, tendon hysteresis, etc. that is necessary for optimal athletic training. Something like skipping, car pushes, hill sprints or similar on the other hand do provide those necessary attributes and traits. And yet interference is a known phenomenon amongst neuroscientists, we can't just write this off. It's referred to in the context of memory retrieval in particular, but it's also believed to affect motor learning. Think about learning two new languages at once, or even switching from the controls of one computer game to another. How about when the y-axis is inverted? One study possibly demonstrates the interference principle in action. Here, professional swimmers were found to have a lower jumping height than members of the general population, even those considered to be unathletic. So, does training with exercises that more closely mimic the desired movement actually confuse the neural maps? 
Is there some kind of strange grey area where a movement is too specific, but without being specific enough? There is good evidence showing that the sled's pull does improve running speed, ground contact time and stride length. This same study also showed that the benefits were greatest when pulling approximately 75% of body weight. As this increased, the athlete slowed down and their technique changed, resulting in less performance. Again, a subtle difference in training drastically alters the outcomes. Where do we draw the line? One consideration is that different sports may require differing levels of specificity. The sprinter will use far more consistent technique during every competition. They are running in a straight line on a flat, consistent surface. The same is true for a rower. Placed firmly on the spot and required to perform the same rowing, piston movement with perfect precision, power and endurance. Compare this with a football player who needs to constantly change speed, change direction, adjust to changes in the ground, and often all while dribbling a ball or making split-second changes in tactics. The football player isn't learning one set of biomechanics, but rather infinite, unpredictable permutations. But perhaps the best technique is no technique. That's because no two movements are ever truly the same. Consider that when a rower rows, every single stroke will be affected by their levels of fatigue in each individual motor unit, altering the recruitment and coordination of muscles. They'll also be affected by the effort of their teammates, how still the water is, the wind, the weight of the boat, the momentum from previous stroke. This is why no rowing machine could ever truly match the experience of actually rowing. We tend to think of force production as being all about output, but this is far from the truth. Input is equally important to refine the movement producing the force. This is our motor perceptual landscape and it is critical in all athletic performance and graceful movement. So I ask you, how can a somewhat similar exercise interfere with a movement pattern that doesn't exist? A movement pattern that is, in truth, already an infinite number of somewhat similar but slightly different movement patterns. In fact, how do we even manage to get out of bed in the morning, especially considering the huge number of forces acting on us and the insane amount of coordination necessary between different joints and muscles? And keep in mind that we're starting off in a slightly different position every time we get up. This is what Nikolai Bernstein refers to as the degrees of freedom problem. He concluded that we store general movement patterns rather than specific techniques. He further states that the more generalised these become, the more robust and broadly applicable they will be. Thus, to train an athlete optimally, you should not only train them under ideal conditions, but also with countless different variations to help them adapt their skills and use them in a helpful and realistic manner. Run when tired, run on wet surfaces, run on dry surfaces, change direction quickly, run in unusual shoes. Dynamical systems theory helps us to further understand this. This explanation describes the body as being comprised of self-organising systems that arrange themselves around three major constraints – environment, goals and organism. In other words, every movement must be a direct response to these forces, which once again vary every time. This helps us to narrow down the perfect movement for the situation. Your body knows which version of the movement pattern to utilise because it is guided by your objectives and the shape of the environment, input and output. So as soon as you raise your hand up to start pushing the truck, your body recognises this as a different movement and selects the correct pattern. Important, though, is to introduce these new variables in training only once the basic movement pattern has been mastered. This provides the stable base to build off from. Once the movement is mastered, then more variables can be introduced in order to test the limits of that new skill. Failing to do this is one way in which specificity can be misapplied by introducing variations too early or too late in the learning process. In other words, we need to learn to walk before we can run, and to run before we can car push. But we see the benefit of varying the precise mechanics and context of a movement in other areas too. Context interference is another concept from neuroscience and memory that this time considers whether we learn better through blocks of rote repetition of a single skill or by randomly training different skills out of sequence. It turns out that the latter option results in a short-term detriment but longer-term benefits. That is to say that by training in a more chaotic and mixed-up manner, you actually improve skill acquisition and transference in the long term. And just as a triathlete can become extremely adept at running, cycling and swimming, just as you can run on sand without forgetting how to run on tarmac, just as you can write the letter A and the letter B, and just as you can differentiate between takeoff and maintenance phases when running, what you may find is that early on in the learning phase, you do experience confusion. And we see this in our day-to-day -day lives too. Yes, learning how to play Doom may initially create confusion when you return to play Call of Duty. But if you practice both for long enough, you can become a master at both. When I first tried to learn to type on my new mini laptop, I found it difficult because I had become accustomed to writing on the bigger keyboard, just like the swimmers might be referring to older neural patterns when trying to jump. But now that I have put in a good number of hours with both keyboards, I have no problem switching from one to the other. 
None of this is to completely write off anyone's personal experience of interference. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. Everyone is different, and as you can see, this is not a straightforward discussion. It's predicated mostly on observation and theory. It may affect some people, some sports, more than others. The point is that your brain is remarkable and can adapt, and that tweaking the variables just enough should help you to land on an exercise that is optimal for your goals, with constant observation, measurement, and iteration. My personal approach to training, of course, is different. I'm not interested in training athletes to be the very best at a controlled sport. Most people watching this won't be professional athletes. My interest is in training myself and others to be as good at as many things as possible. I'm interested in the strategies used by functional coaches because they are the masters at making the athletes faster, more endurant, or better at jumping higher. They know which exercises are optimal for those activities. I want to see what exercises and techniques I can take from those to incorporate into my own training. I want to be fast as well as strong, so if I'm only squatting, I may not be getting the most possible benefits from my training. But seeing as I want that bone density and max strength, I'm going to continue to squat as well. Consider for a moment that in nature there is no such thing as a technique. While certain sports may encourage us to attempt to use nearly identical techniques wherever possible, when moving through a natural environment, every movement will be different, and your goals will be constantly changing. Practicing a specific technique is then, in fact, a human thing, and not entirely natural. And we certainly wouldn't repeat the same movement over and over again for 10 reps. Maybe it makes perfect sense that performing a random sequence of movements actually leads to better transference, as that is how we practice movement in reality. So perhaps the question to leave you on is, why should you repeat 10 reps of anything? Sure, keeping the focus on one muscle group will increase time under tension, and it will thus allow for more muscle damage and metabolic stress. But you can still accomplish that with slight variations of the same movement. Instead of push-up, 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 what about push-up, archer push-up, one-handed push-up, Maltese push-up, push-up? That still keeps the focus on the pecs while being more creative and challenging. Something to consider if you're looking for ways to mix up your training. So that was a fairly in-depth discussion on functional training. I hope you found it interesting. If you did, then you may be interested in pre-ordering my book, Functional Training and Beyond, which is coming out next month. That's a book that explores all the concepts of functional training and how they can be applied to all of our lifestyles. Alternatively, if you're interested in starting a more super functional form of training right now, then I have an ebook and training program that's linked in the description down below. And there's a discount on right now whilst many of us are in lockdown. Thanks so much for watching this one. I hope you really enjoyed it. I'm hoping to get one out next week, but we'll have to see how it goes over the Christmas period. Thanks a ton for watching. And bye for now.